Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Welcome to CSIS. My name is Jane Nakano. I'm a senior fellow with uh, Energy Security and Climate Change Program or, over at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you uh, out there uh, in the, um, 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 on the, um, this, uh, I guess, webinar or web event. Um, uh, here uh, we are having the fourth uh, event under the Energy Innovation uh, Series. This Energy Innovation Series is something that we've been uh, we've started uh, earlier this year with the partnership and with the input from the U.S. Department of Energy's Office of Technology Transitions and Chief Commercialization Officer. Uh, the idea here is for all of us to get to know a little more about how the, uh, the not just the importance of energy innovation. Uh, but then also how this ecosystem works. Um, so in the, the past uh, three uh, events that we've done uh, covered uh, each, um, technologies like grid uh, modernization, also energy storage and batteries, uh, as well as carbon management. Uh, this uh, fourth event uh, looks at the um, uh, advanced nuclear. Uh, and this is uh, something that um, is you know, very much um, uh, you know, something that I've been following for quite some time. It's very exciting for us to have a great um, uh, speakers and experts today uh, to better appreciate what role uh, the each uh, key stakeholder uh, group plays, uh, but then also how this um, DOE works uh, with its labs um, and also with uh, companies, uh, developers of technologies but then also how uh, it interacts with policy community. Um, in many ways, uh, you know, the, you know, for the past, I'd say four or five decades, uh, the nuclear uh, energy, uh, commercial nuclear energy fleet in the US, but then also around the world uh, has been you know, dominated by the large scale um, light water reactors. But in the past decade or so, uh, many of us are starting to notice where now talking about a lot of different things now, it's not just the large scale uh, light water reactors and um, they're uh, sort of smaller scale um, uh, reactors that use uh, prefabricated uh, modular uh, components, uh, so-called SMRs. Also, a lot of folks are starting to look at technologies that, are, that use uh, fuels that are not um, pressurized water uh, or different uh, types of uh, you know, fuels. Um, so, it's, uh, it's very exciting for all of us to sort of get to take a peek into what's happening. Uh, and um, here uh, today, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure for us to be joined by Dr. Rita Brownwell, who is the Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Energy. Thank you, um, from DOE. And uh, we've asked her to, um, in her brief um, keynote, to tell us you know, what sort of a priorities DOE has, um, but then also how she sees the role of innovation in what uh, she is doing with her colleagues at DOE. Um, after the keynote, uh, I will be moving to a panel discussion with excellent experts. Um, you know, everyone probably has a full bio uh, on the computer screen. So just quickly, um, let me tell you who they are. Um, uh, I joined by Dr. Ashley Feynman. She's the inaugural director of the National uh, Reactor Innovation Center, um, which uh, came about per the authorization um, uh, uh, following the, the passage of the uh, uh, Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act of 2017. Uh, it's located at Idaho National Lab. Uh, so she's here to tell us more about, uh, give us more insights into how the lab uh, system works and, and especially her um, uh, undertaking vis-a-vis -vis, um, advanced nuclear reactor. And then following um, Dr. Finan, uh, Chris Colbert with uh, new, uh, new Scale uh, Power uh, will join us and uh, tell us what it is that New Scale is doing, uh, working hard to develop and commercialize uh, nuclear, um, sorry, New Scale is leading, leading the pack of um, uh, small modular and advanced reactor companies and designs 
Uh, and uh, there's quite a bit that I think the company um, has, um, uh, you know, the sort of a rich experience it has vis-a-vis -vis lab as well as the regulators. So um, look forward to your comments, Chris. And then last but not least, uh, we're joined by Todd Allen, uh, who is the chair and as well as professor of, um, let me not, um, uh, let me get this straight, the, the nuclear, I'm sorry, um, the nuclear engineering and radiological um, sciences, sorry about that, uh, with the uh, University of Michigan. He actually has a, a, a great insight into sort of policy environment, but he also has background uh, in more of a technical side from his time at national labs, including uh, Idaho National Lab. And also he's a submarine uh, officer right, uh, with the US Navy. So he brings uh, broad uh, and very deep um, backgrounds and experiences in nuclear as well. Well, but, um, and just a, a quick household, a housekeeping uh, note. Uh, those of you in the audience who, uh, who are interested in asking questions, uh, there is a little button on the screen that says, I think, uh, ask questions button. So uh, you can uh, enter your question there and that will be um, uh, uh, forwarded to all of us on the panel. And I will try my best to ask these questions to the experts, but that will be towards the end after we will have a keynote and then followed by the uh, uh, sort of a panel discussion. Um, without uh, much ado, um, the um, Assistant Secretary Barron, we're so pleased that you could join us um, and thank you so much. And the floor is yours. Great. Thank you all for attending this fourth session of the CI CSIS Energy Innovation Series. And especially thank you, Jane, for the invitation to uh, give the keynote and speak to you this, this afternoon. Um, I view nuclear energy as being absolutely crucial to ensuring the sustainability of our environment now and into the future. Nuclear energy is this country's largest source of clean, reliable, and resilient electricity generating in resilient electricity that generates about 20% of the electricity in the United States and over 55% of this country's clean energy. In 2019 alone, the electricity that was generated by nuclear in the United States avoided the release of over 476 million metric tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. And that is the equivalent of removing 100 million cars off the road. So that's a pretty phenomenal figure. There are many countries around the world that see nuclear energy as a means to meeting their energy demand and growth, supporting their clean energy goals and providing energy diversity and security, just like we do here in the United States. I'm so confident that the United States nuclear energy technologies can and will play a major role in providing the United States and the world with clean, reliable energy for many decades to come. Nuclear energy is re revolutionary beyond electricity generation though. It can provide low emission energy for water desalination to achieve worldwide water security. It can be used to decarbonize the industrial sector with process heat. It can also be used to decarbonize the transportation sector with hydrogen and electrification. We recently awarded here from uh, my office of nuclear energy, we awarded $9.2 million through an IFOA award for a pilot program at the Davis Bessey Power Plant outside of Toledo, Ohio for hydrogen generation. Um, and then what, finally, we, nuclear energy can also be used for the betterment of humankind by way of medical applications, as well as space exploration. There are new advanced nuclear reactors that have the potential to solve the diverse challenges across our nation, as well as across the globe. And I know that we'll be talking about that later this afternoon. At DOE, we're focusing our efforts around four major priorities. The first is to sustain our existing fleet of 95 operating nuclear reactors. The next, which is the topic of this, this webinar here today, is to get advanced reactor technologies across the finish line, and it certainly is a top priority of mine. The third priority is to establish and maintain the critical fuel cycle infrastructure that is needed to commercialize technologies, not only in this country, but uh, abroad as well, from, in taking care of the reactor packages from cradle to grave. And then finally, enhancing global comp competitiveness to allow the United States to be a top competitor um, and a preeminent leader in technology in this area. In April of this year, the President's Nuclear Fuel Working Group report was released. 
It's entitled Restoring America's Competitive Nuclear Energy Advantage. And it lays out policy options to restore America's leadership in nuclear energy and technology. The report recommends continued support for the demonstration of US advanced nuclear technologies. My office took action on that by launching the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, or ARDP for short. This program focuses DOE and non-federal resources on the actual construction of advanced demonstration reactors that are affordable to build and to operate. The window for solicitations is currently open and the deadline to apply is August 12th, so next month. We are strongly supporting the National Reactor Innovation Center, which you'll learn much more about from Dr. Fanin in a moment to enable these demonstrations and the development of the versatile test reactor, VTR, to ensure that we have the infrastructure that's needed to support the long-term success of US advanced nuclear technologies. We're moving forward to ensure that the United States regains its nuclear energy leadership, building upon the United States leadership in innovation and advanced technologies. But it won't be easy and will require quite a bit of work in particular, if we want to stay aggressive to achieve these goals and achieve them by 2030. I'm very confident that working together, we can address the challenges that are facing nuclear energy to meet a wide range of needs in a low carbon future. I really appreciate the dedication that all of you have to this very important issue. And I look forward to the panel discussion this afternoon to engaging with many of you on our endeavor to change the world. And on that note, I want to end with a quote from the Lorax, which was given to me by a friend of mine. And if you're not familiar with the Lorax, um, it is actually very salient to the nuclear industry at the moment. But one of the last lines of the book is that now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And so I look forward to working with all of you to ensure that our entire lot gets better. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you so very much, Dr. Barron. Well, that was great. Um, I actually am not familiar with the lower upside. I need to go get it or order it online and <laughs> check it out. But I mean, it was fantastic. I mean, DOE has, you know, the whole, you know, the wide range of research uh, activities and within, you know, even nuclear as well, there's so much happening and it was great to get your keynote, uh, great to, you know, sort of, you know, if you will see whole, you know, range of uh, nuclear um, issues, uh, the research undertakings that you're leading. But thank you very much. Um, now, uh, let me move to the panel. Um, so again, uh, I'm joined by Ashley Finan, uh, Chris Colbert, and Todd Allen. Um, so I wanted to make this uh, sort of conversational. Uh, you know, we just heard a, a great keynote from Assistant Secretary Baron Wall. Um, so there, you know, there's the focus on existing nuclear. There's also um, the uh, advanced nuclear, and then also the supply um, supply issue. Um, so I guess the second, uh, I guess, box or the, the category is where, you know, I'd like to get, uh, take a sort of a deeper dive uh, with all of you. The, so um, Dr. Finan, if you can uh, sort of, you know, uh, tell us, you know, what are, you know, the, the, some of the, the, I mean, there are a lot of things that a DOE prioritizes, but within that, what are some of the emphasis in more like, you know, right at the moment? And also, how do you see um, the lab's role in sort of realizing these, you know, uh, missions and goals? Sure. Thanks for the question, Jane. And, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this, in this great event. Um, so DOE is prioritizing research and development activities that can reduce costs, um, as well as improve efficiency and safety and resolve key performance and feasibility challenges um, really on a broad range of advanced reactor technologies. And those include gas, metal, and molten salt coal designs, um, as well as the, the light water designs that you'll hear about from Chris Colbert. Um, DOE is, um, Dr. Barrenwald described this program a little bit, but DOE is, in, is intending to refine its prioritization based on the innovative designs that are selected under the advanced reactor demonstration program to assure that those projects can meet their aggressive development and deployment schedules. So in other words, DOE intends to, um, to align its R&D to support those demonstration programs 
um, to some degree. DU is also considering the application of designs being pursued by industry. So Dr. Barronwall mentioned these as well, um, but hydrogen production, space exploration, um, and those can help determine the direction and prioritization of R&D under the various advanced reactor campaigns. Um, the labs play a very important role in this. Really in every energy technology, our national labs play a critical role. Um, but perhaps most significantly in nuclear energy. The United States really developed a rich infrastructure and body of expertise in nuclear technology research, development, and demonstration during the first wave of nuclear energy development, which was largely government-driven. Um, we've maintained parts of that infrastructure and a very strong expertise in the lab system, as well as many of the materials and capabilities that are important for the successful research um, development and demonstration of these technologies. So rather than relying on each company to develop these infrastructure capabilities, the labs allow the nation to invest in platforms that can support any of these private sector innovations. And we can have a regular cadence of innovation. It's not a one-time event. Um, innovation is never a one-time event. And this also allows the country to retain and grow its leadership position, which I know is a, a priority um, for Dr. Barringwall and, and for the DOE. So the labs are really gearing up to assist the companies in their demonstration efforts. Um, and the National Reactor Innovation Center is um, a national program that's based at Idaho National Laboratory. And, and it plays a key role in coordinating and leveraging those resources and in ensuring that they're really prepared and available to the innovators who need them. Uh, that was great. Um, and in particular, though, if you will, like, you know, so, um, you know, for some of us who, you know, um, follow nuclear closely, I think the establishment of National um, uh, Reactor Innovation Center was, a, you know, really, um, you know, a big event. If you could sort of um, uh, just you know, tell uh, those of us who may not be, you know, those that are much less familiar, like what was so special about it, if you will, um, um, that would be great. Just sure. to <laughs> um, Yeah, I can try. I mean, I think that the, the National Reactor Innovation Center, as well as the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program really represents um, a national commitment to U.S. global leadership in nuclear energy technology that we haven't seen in a long time. So, I'm, um, I'm really heartened by that. I'm really excited to have this opportunity. And Enric's, Enric's mission is to accelerate the demonstration of these advanced technologies because we've, you know, the, there are a lot of people who over many decades have worked to lay the groundwork for this. They've, they've worked on the technology, they've worked hard, they've de developed the new tools and the new materials and the new fuels that we need to move forward. Um, and there are folks who have been working hard on the policy side to develop the mechanisms that we need to move forward at this point and in the regulatory space as well. At this point, um, we need to continue all of that work, but we, what we have to do right now is demonstrate these technologies. So ENRIC is a supporting program and our mission is to accelerate the demonstration of advanced reactors um, by inspiring stakeholders with the, the promise and in fact, the ability to move this forward um, by empowering innovators with access to the national lab and its capabilities and, and resources. Um, and then finally, with delivering success through efficient coordination of partners and resources. So that's really our, our role as I see it. Um, and I, I think we're really uh, poised for success here with the DOE's commitment, um, the administration's commitment, and, and also the um, other policymakers who are, who are highly committed to restoring glo global leadership. Um, and developing these technologies and demonstrating them. Great, no, thank you so much. Um, so let me bring you in, Chris. Um, so, you know, um, tell us, uh, please, you know, what, you know, uh, New Skill is developing and, and how is it different from uh, what we've been seeing in the nation's uh, nuclear fleet um, since 1970s? Um, and in many ways, like what, how is it not just different from perhaps what we see in existing fleet, but like with other folks that are developing um, sort of advanced uh, SMRs and advanced uh, reactors today. Uh, 
thanks, Jane. Uh, first of all, for those of you who don't have the time like me to read the Lorax, you can actually get it on Netflix. So it's a wonderful animated short. And uh, I think you can uh, get that. Uh, I think it's $2.99 for a weekly rental. Uh, anyways, what New Scale is doing is a little bit different is uh, we're developing a new modular light water reactor nuclear power plant. This groundbreaking technology features a fully factory fabricated small modular reactor. So that's both the reactor and its containment. Uh, capable of generating up to 60 megawatts of electricity using a safer, smaller, and scalable version of pressurized water reactor technology. The pressurized water re reactor technology has been in operation for the last 50 years, so there's a lot of operational experience of what works, what doesn't work, but especially in materials, designs, uh, and fuels available to us that we can really leverage going forward. Uh, but with our scalable design, we can house up to 12 of those individual 60 megawatt modules uh, each about 76 feet tall, uh, to provide up to 720 megawatts of carbon-free power. So when you look at a small modular reactor at 60 megawatts, that's much smaller than the gigawatt size uh, you typically see. But by having that scalability, we can get up to almost that same size for grids that have larger requirements. Um, we're also able to uh, do electrical generation and provide it for other uh, opportunities. If you look at carbon generation, you know, about one third of carbon comes from uh, the like, production of electricity, about two thirds from process industries or transportation. So having these smaller modules to do hydrogen um, uh, synthesis, as uh, the secretary pointed out earlier, um, also working to provide heat for plants, provides the ability to get into that two thirds of carbon generation that currently we don't get to as nuclear. Um, we also have the ability um, to put these modules in place incrementally. So if you're in a smaller grid where you may only need 360 megawatts or something less, you can put in the number of modules you need and grow as you need to to meet the needs. Uh, what most people don't realize is in many countries, you know, some of their grids are the size of a gigawatt size plant. And it's just not feasible to put nuclear into that, that footprint. With a small module reactor, you can go into those, those opportunities and provide the benefits of clean, uh, nuclear generation power. Um, we're also, in terms of differential uh, from the uh, older plants of the 70s, um, we also, with the integral design, instead of having everything being brought to the field and assembled, uh, by being done in the factory, we think we'll have a great savings in terms of moving that uh, work from a you know uncontrolled, exposed to the environment situation to a more controlled facility. And generally, if you look at shipbuilding experience, what they will tell you is that you know, what take uh, what may take one hour in the factory takes seven hours outside of the construction hole and 14 hours inside the construction hole. So even though we've gone smaller, we get the benefit of that scalability and moving work from the construction site, which is, you know, costly and always on the critical path to in a factory where we can do it in a controlled way. Um, finally, with our design, uh, we do have the ability from a safety standpoint um, for what we call a triple crown of safety, which is basically uh, for our design, we're able to self uh, to long term indefinite cool all 12 new scale reactors in a 12 module plant uh, for an unlimited coping period, meaning we don't need to add water, we don't need to use electricity, and we don't need any operator action in order to effectuate the safe shutdown and long term cooling of the plant. If you look at most situations, the biggest vulnerability to uh, existing plants is the loss of offsite power, uh, which results in them needing to bring in uh, additional emergency diesel generators, so on and so forth, which um, you know are reliable. You know, uh, you need to rely upon because of that safety design, and because we don't rely upon reactor coolant pumps, and we have that safety. We've been able to eliminate about two thirds of the systems and components that you find in a typical large reactor. So with that simplification, it means that there's less things to go wrong, which means from a safety standpoint, there are less events to go wrong that could result to a bad situation. It also means you don't have as much opportunity for the plant to go down and lose all 12 modules of operation at one point in time. So we see a great opportunity for us to be uh, moving the state of the art with the uh, current uh, reactor designs uh, using and leveraging you know, existing technology but also taking advantage of the ability to go modular and smaller as we bridge to whatever may be the next uh, set of advanced reactor designs going forward. Thank you so much, Chris. 
So, I mean, there, I think, you know, there are many um, sort of features to the design, uh, you know, that will be making you know, improvements, uh, addressing, you know, a lot of concerns that I think uh, industry has received uh, over the decades. Um, but, you know, makes me think that it, that probably means also, you know, uh, regulatory processes, as well as some of the policy processes probably need to keep changing or um, have to probably look perhaps differently um, for, you know, in the, um, you know, when these, um, many of these units get deployed, uh, perhaps, um, you know, later half of this decade. Um, so now let me turn to Todd. Um, I mean, in your view, you know, what are some of the, you know, the changes that, that are needed uh, for, you know, policy, but then also regulatory processes to, uh, to be able to accommodate, if you will, uh, the robust deployment of these uh, new reactor types? And also, how are we doing so far? I mean, are we, you know, um, aside from what are type of the perhaps changes we need, you know, are we making good progress to be able to be there to support the deployment? Yeah, thanks, Jean. That's a great question. I think when you ask what are the policies that you want, you're really asking the question, what do I look like now? What do I wish I looked like? And, and what are the, the processes necessary to get there? So I think I wanna answer the question by, by saying, what did we look like 10 years ago? What did we look like five years ago? And where are we, on, where are we now? So I go back 10 years, about a decade. The nuclear innovation in the US was very much government driven and research and development. Um, the Nuclear Energy Institute put out a study a couple of years back that looked at federal spending on different energy technologies. And nuclear was interesting in that it was primarily R&D. Um, other energy technologies did what I'll call uh, incentives to commercialization, so more tax breaks or power purchase agreements. We pretty much just asked for R&D. And I'm, I'm a researcher, I love research, but we're not good at turning that into commercial products. And we are pretty much stuck on large light water reactors. Even though the markets were changing, um, not everyone was regulated. So we're in this position where the one product we had was not necessarily the product that was gonna make sense in the future. Right? So you just say, well, what would you want to change? Right? And I would say, there's a few things. One, you'd want on the research side uh, to be able to go from asking for a lot of innovation, trying stuff out, um, accepting that a lot of it might not work, right? Let it fail. But the good stuff, you sort of bubble up and spend more money on it and move towards commercialization. So have a good research, robust research platform. And at the same time, look for ways to incentivize commercial companies like Chris's to actually go to market, right? Which we really weren't asking for 10 years ago. I think the second thing you wanted, and Ashley um, hinted at this is, we've got this great national laboratory system. How do you make that available to all the commercial developers? And how do you keep that system as vibrant as possible, right? It's not static. It should actually stay one step ahead of the developers, right? So you want robust R&D, you want incentives to commercialization. You needed a regulator who was positioned to be nimble at regulating concepts that no one had looked at before commercially. Right? You don't want the rules right, that you set up around first generation technology to guide necessarily what different technologies look like. So as a simple analogy, we set design rules around, around cars to make sure that if you get in a crash, your gas tank will not explode. Right? I don't need that same set of rules around an EV because it doesn't have a gas tank. Right? You need to think about what the regulatory process for the system you're trying to bring to commercialization. And then I think the fourth thing that you need is um, a way to compete in international markets, right? Our system is very much uh, private, privately driven, but we do have a lot of government functions um, that will help us, whether that's in finance, it's in um, safeguards and non-proliferation, uh, it's in commerce, right? So you'd want a nice coordinated approach. And so I'd say 10 years ago, we we weren't doing all those things. We were pretty much doing R&D. So then you go back about five years ago, and I, I will sort of historically always think that this was the seminal pivot point for a lot of things, sort of the 2015, 2016, where we started to create all of those structures that we need for this next generation of technology. And so I'll just use a few as examples. Um, and I think they're, um, they're starting points for longer conversations. So I'll start out with GAIN. 
So GAIN was a White House led program that came out 2015 ish. But um, essentially it said, let's make the capabilities of the national laboratories available to the set of commercial reactor developers, right? This is a change. This is a change from um, R&D driven by national laboratories to we're going to try to get these commercial, some, some portion of these commercial companies over the finish line. And we've got a tremendous asset in the national labs. Let's make that available. And if you follow gain forward in time, you get things like NREC. You get the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program. Um, uh, you get the DOE programs. If you looked over the past five years, they've gone from gain, which are smaller um, support where you can come in and get a little bit of time um, or support from the laboratory all the way up to now we're talking about demonstrations of full concepts and we've set up this NREC right to help make that happen. Um, second category of things I would say are more uh, law, um, public, public policy and I point back to maybe the first um, advanced reactor summit that happened in 2016. Right, where we convened the community to get together, sort of led by, by Third Way. And it said, look, we've got bipartisan, bicameral support for this technology. What do we need to change? And from that point forward, you see things like, sorry, Ashley, I'm going to keep saying nice things about you just because you're online. But you had organizations like Ashley's previous organization, the Nuclear Innovation Alliance, that are putting out these seminal documents on how we need to change the regulatory space. Similarly, Jessica Lovering at Breakthrough was talking about um, what we need to do in innovation space. And we start to get legislation passed like NEMA and NECA, which go to NRC regulatory changes. It goes to uh, backstopping national capabilities. Um, we start to see renewable portfolio standards at the state level being converted to clean energy standards. Right? So you can go back to that sort of 2016 timeframe and our recognition that we're in a position where we can change policy and we've changed it. I do to do a lot of hard work by some people. And I'd say the third one, and I don't think we talk about it enough, uh, but I want to give credit to uh, Rachel Slabaugh for starting this nuclear energy, en energy boot camp. Why do I think that's going to be historically seen as a big deal? It's because she recognized that, A, it's more than just technology development. It's business cases. It's community engagement. And she also recognizes that there was a generation of young people that cared about energy technology and clean energy and climate and wanted to do nuclear in a sophisticated way. And we needed to start um, being relevant to them. Okay? And as you go forward, you see then things in RPE uh, where we're, we're working on demonstrating programs where nuclear was never a part of that conversation. So, so I would say we're making a lot of steps um, towards fixing the policy, um, the policy environment. Um, there's still a few things that we need to do and we, we can talk about that if we have more time. Um, but, I, but I would say, you know, sort of four big categories and we're making a lot of progress. Um, and as, as you see, just talking to, um, to Chris and what's going on with his company and others and what's happening at the labs, I, I actually think we're moving forward for quite well. Great, no, thank you so much, um, Todd, for sort of bringing in um, somewhat, um, well, I guess near sort of, you know, historical background, if you will, but um, the, and as you said, though, I, I think um, you know the, all these companies are starting to be. Um, it, it's, it's becoming much more company driven as opposed to government driven. And sort of quickly going back to um, you know what you're seeing uh, at Idaho, um, Ashley. I mean, what are some of the sort of breakthroughs uh, that you're seeing? In, you know, perhaps you know things perhaps yeah you do at the lab, but then also what the companies are trying to bring to the table and trying to get you know some testing uh, done for example. Sure. Thanks, Jane. So I think, um, you know, some of these have been mentioned, but I'll just, you know, briefly cover that there are um, advancements in different fuels and different coolants that are important. Um, but I think some of the most, well, and, and I guess um, I'll mention the applications as well, different sizes of reactors, different applications of reactors. Dr. Baron Wall spoke to some of that. Um, and, and I think that they're all interesting breakthroughs, but the ones that are the most compelling are those that really reduce costs and improve schedule and scalability, because fundamentally that's something that's not going right for nuclear in the West right now, and we need to fix that. And that is, that is job one, um, I would say, in terms of attributes that we need to have in 
advanced nuclear systems. So some of those technologies are entirely new, like the new materials and the new fuels that can improve our, our nuclear core systems. Some are new to nuclear, but not new to the world. So um, the factory built approach that Mr. Colbert was describing, that is, is critical um, in a, a pathway to reducing delays and cost overruns during construction. Um, that can also make deployment more scalable, which is important to addressing these global challenges like decarbonization and energy security and energy access. That's not going to happen with the help of nuclear if nuclear can't be scalable. So we need these next technologies to be scalable. And so those are key things that are being developed. Um, another example would be digital engineering techniques that can allow us to really move through the design um, licensing, construction, and operations in a really coordinated and efficient way. And digital engineering is used widely in non-nuclear construction, um, as well as in nuclear construction in the East to, to very good effect, um, but it isn't fully Im implemented in nuclear construction in the West. So at the National Reactor Innovation Center, we are developing some approaches to digital, digital engineering in nuclear, um, and we're working with some existing projects like the versatile test reactor to, to use to develop those. And then we're demonstrating them on any projects that we're working on with the goal of making those widely available for industry use so that we'll see um, these improvements. And, and um, just as an example, in other construction fields, digital engineering has produced at least 25% increases in productivity. Um, and at Boeing in aerospace, the use of digital twins for some of their products produced a 40% improvement in first time quality. So these are potentially enormous impacts on costs. And those are the, those are the, um, the breakthroughs that I think are the most important to us right now. There are a lot of others. Um, and if you want me to speak to anything specific, Jane, let me know. But, but I think those are the most important right now. No, it's great. I, I'm glad that you uh, mentioned that because I think some of the questions that I'm starting to get from the audience do uh, relate to, uh, you know, what more could be done uh, to make these advanced reactors, uh, you know, commercially viable, um, if you will. Um, but, um, you know, if, um, if I can bring back Chris um, a little more. So, you know, in many ways, I think, you know, as I said, I think, you know, New Scale is really leading the path of uh, you know, companies looking to uh, develop and, and deploy. Um, and I, you know, I'm sure that each company's, you know, experience is, you know, um, unique, but then uh, to the extent that uh, there could be some sort of lessons that the new skill uh, can share with others that are, you know, that will be going through, uh, ex you know, the experience working with the lab. Uh, and or regulators, uh, for example, you know, Oklo recently uh, submitted an application and and again, you know, perhaps there are some key differences because of the, you know, the fuel that they use uh, that, that's different from uh, new scale, et cetera. But, you know, if you could give us some sense of like how, you know, what the process is like, how it's like to be working with uh, lab uh, and also the regulators that, um, you know, uh, that would be great. Okay, so uh, let me split it between the, the, the labs and DOE and, and then the regulators. Um, you know, without the DOE, New Scale wouldn't be here. Uh, back in 2000, uh, Dr. Jose Reyes, who's our co-founder and chief technology officer, uh, won a small grant at the time from DOE NE, uh, Nuclear Energy the Department that um, Secretary Barronwall heads up now. And I think it was about two or $3 million at the time, but basically laid out the principles for a multi-application, light water, small reactor. And so all the things we talk about attribute wise that we're looking to demonstrate both in terms of smaller and safer, cost effective, but also multi-application and having a greater reach beyond just large gigawatt size electricity generating plant, uh, all started back from that uh, back in 2000. And since then, we've had over 70 different collaborations um, with research institutions hitting a number of the laboratories throughout the uh, complex uh, run by the uh, Department of Energy uh, over that time, and leverage about probably $34 million in, in external research on a number of different activities, whether it be in cybersecurity, whether it be in fuel, whether it be in materials, um, uh, simulation. I mean, we've run the gamut across all of that uh, 
through a number of different um, opportunities. Uh, what I would say, and I give kudos to uh, Secretary Barnwell on this, is really um, what I've seen is, you know, think about it. Back in 2020, 2000, geez, I can't even say 2000 now. It seems like it's years ago. Or it was years ago. Uh, 2000 is when New Scale sort of started conceptually. And we're looking at the mid to late 2020s of being deployed. You know, the secretary is now taken into Todd's point of looking at not only the game program and NRIC, but now there's vehicles to take from, you know, the early stage R&D to now where there is advanced reactor deployment program available uh, to folks to get to that deployment stage of their technology. Uh, so hopefully it'll happen a lot faster um, with them. But, you know, my, my takeaway from it is that you know, clearly DOE was was instrumental for us. I know they're instrumental for, for previous um, designs and the US government's always been instrumental, instrumental in making civilian nuclear uh, commercial and bringing it to the forefront. Uh, so I think that's continuing. You know, my lesson learned is that, you know, it, it is a partnership, it's a public private partnership. And, you know, like many things, um, you know, depending on how long you were dating before you got married, there's stuff you find out after the partnership is, is, is made. And so there's effort and requirements in there that, you know, you'll sit there and say, gee, this isn't quite what I expected, but, you know, in balance, it's been a very good relationship. Um, and I could just tell people that to the extent they can avail themselves of it, they should take it because some of our best and smartest are sitting there in the laboratories and they want to see us succeed. So, you know, take advantage of it. On the regulatory front, um, you know, we're sort of in that interesting place where we were a hybrid between, you know, sort of advanced reactors in that we were doing things like multiple modules being controlled from a single control room, um, having a new scale power module done in a factory, having a, you know, triple crown of safety where we don't need offsite power. So we had a number of exemptions, to the current NRC regulations, which did not contemplate a design like ours. So, you know, for example, if you go to the NRC, they say, you know, what do you do for offsite power? You know, do you have two transmission lines coming in from the grid to power you in case you lose power at the plant? Well, our answer is we don't need any offsite power. So why is that a requirement? But it seems very logical, but when you get to the NRC and they have their regulations, you have to work through those with them and find your path through the regulatory um, framework to do that. And I think that New Scale has sort of led the way to many of these concepts of working through exemptions and concepts of multiple reactors operational from a single site, as well as, you know, having emergency planning zones that could be at the site boundary because the safety case supports that are all things that we, we paved the way for. So others like Oklo coming in uh, behind us will hopefully benefit from that experience and, you know, be able to go through the process, you know, uh, hopefully quicker. Um, uh, we hope it's quicker and uh, with less challenges of new ground being plowed for them. So, you know, there's been a lot of learning done with the DOE made possible for new scale, a lot of learning done with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission as we've gone through and, and charted out new things. Um, and I will say, you know, it is a partnership um, and each partner brings with it its own, you know, pluses and minuses. And you, you need to work together to find your path through there the most efficient way possible. You know, it's not gonna be simply it's my way or the highway or it's your way and, and that's the way it is. It has to be really looked at as to overall, how can you get through these processes efficiently? And, you know, and I hope that the next reactors that come in isn't a 25 year from conception to design cycle like New Scale was. I hope it's 10 years. I hope that the regulatory review process wasn't 42 months like it was for New Scale. We expect to get our license and uh, or our final safety evaluation report in September of this year, so two months away. Uh, I hope it's 36 or 32 months. You know, let's always be striving to bring that together. And I think uh, people are, are looking to do that. Um, so if you're open-minded about it, uh, it's a you know great place to work. And I'll tell you, once you're approved and you go through the rigor in the United States, uh, the world's your oyster because the number of people who are calling us up from overseas interested in our technology is just you know, we can't continue to respond to the, the level of interest. The closer we get through that NRC process, the greater the interest becomes and the greater the opportunity for the whole US sector to see a, you know, really a rebirth and resurgence of being deployed uh, internationally. And 
that's a great sort of a um, um, common, um, I mean, you know, uh, it, it's great to get that insight from you, Chris. And I was thinking also, I mean, the, you know, you talked about the pace, sort of the learning curve that uh, the, you know, regular regulators um, uh, have had to have thus far, because, you know, mainly what they're used to um, has been sort of large scale uh, light water reactors. So then going forward, I mean, what is the pace like, would you say, of companies um, you know, that would be interested in um, getting in. Perhaps, I mean, there's obviously, you know, working with the lab side and also regulators. So maybe this question goes to you, Todd. Um, you know, there are a lot of companies out there. Um, you know, what's the sense that you're getting, um, you know, as far as the appetites that companies have in taking it and they keep sort of, um, you know, striving towards, you know, to, you know, hit all the, the important um, sort of benchmarks. Yeah, so that's interesting. So, um, you know, I think every company is different, right? Um, and so they're, you know, they're on different pathways. Uh, I think New Scale clearly, first one through the gate, um, they're taking down a number of barriers, getting the NRC to look differently at technology. Chris explained that very well. Um, you know, New um, Oklo, next company through, you know, they're formally working with the NRC. Uh, they're, they're really trying to get the NRC to look um, and regulate differently, um, so it's for their concept. And some of the other the other technologies, I think, are very purposely looking forward in the future. Right. So you have some that want to be very near-term deployers, and I think there are others that um, uh, just have a different sense of when they want to be ready. Um, I do think they're all very interested in um, this being the long haul, meaning they've got near-term commercialization goals, and for that, you don't necessarily need to be super innovative. Right? But I know a lot of them are thinking about, okay, I'll deploy version one, right? but they're already thinking about what's version two. How do I bring the costs down? How do I get more value from this? Um, I find a lot of the companies are being very sophisticated about business cases. right? It's not just electricity. It's electricity. It may be, it may be heat. It may be industrial support directly. Uh, I think that's um, very impressive. So the thing that gets me most excited about this whole advanced reactor world is, you know, go back to my, where were we 10 years ago, right? It was, we used to be gigawatt scale electricity. And now you've got so many different approaches pushing the system to improve. Um, but I think we will, uh, both the system, meaning the technologies that are getting deployed, but also the way we support them. Some of the things that Ashley talked about in her program. Sorry about that. I'm having a little problem with the mute button. Um, the um, that sort of leads me to uh, want to ask. So there are a couple of questions coming in about more of a financing or competition uh, related questions from the audience. Uh, you know, so you know we need market. I mean, it's great to have these advanced uh, reactor concepts and a lot of companies uh, striving to uh, commercialize them. Um, but, you know, we do keep, you know, reading and hearing about sort of a global competition becoming quite fierce, if you will. And how, um, what are some of the perhaps policy um, steps, um, both from the Congress and, and uh, perhaps the executive branch of White House, that you think um, uh, are needed to really um, help the U.S. Uh, advanced reactor community to take it to really the final uh, point, which is to say that it's going to be a vi commercially viable product. And then, um, Ashley, also from your perspective, you know, what are some of the things you think about, um, you know, obviously the, the innovation is the sort of mandate that you have as you work with all these companies, you're probably also aware of what other international competitors are perhaps doing in the, the advanced technology space. How do you see uh, sort of the um, the efforts and the timeline sort of working out or what could be done more perhaps uh, not as a lab person but you know as sort of general observation what more needs to be done and and Chris you too like you know as you think about all these overseas markets arguably um, there is you know potentially more demand overseas for nuclear perhaps first time uh, 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 nuclear uh, newcomers if you will um, so, you know, how do you see, where, where is the opportunity for companies like you to compete and perhaps out-compete um, international rivals in this space? 
You want me to go first? Okay, I'll go. Um, so, you know, what we've seen is new scale. I mentioned that the phone's ringing off the hook. Uh, it, it is. Um, and, you know, one of it has been because of what we've been doing in the development space and the progress with both our licensing and with our first project at, um, at the Idaho National Laboratory with the, the UAMPS Carbon Free Power Project. So people are following that. In fact, I can't tell you how many times there's a story posted that we get the question of like, you know, what does this mean? How do we interpret that? What is, how does that mean for new scale? Um, the other thing that came through uh, recently and generated a lot of uh, discussion from our overseas folks is the, um, the you know, policy shift that's pending perhaps at the Development Finance Corp to uh, finance nuclear uh, potentially moving forward. And, you know, what we see is, you know, we don't have to have the cheapest form of financing. We need to have an overall offering that's affordable to the host country because we think that given our safety attributes and the fact of having a safe and safeguarded plan to U.S. standards, most countries want that over other options. So the question is, how do you make it affordable to them? And I tell people, you know, when I graduated from college, there was the car I wanted and there was the car I bought. And the car I bought was because there was 0% down financing. And that's just the way it was. So we need to be able to compete on that part of it. Now, was that financing the cheapest financing I could have got? Probably not overall if I use my chartered financial analyst uh, financial methodologies uh, looking at it. But it, was, it is what I could afford. And I think we can compete on that basis is if we can get institutions like the Development Finance Corporation, the USXM, and also some additional um, exercise of, of, um, of options that are out there from U.S. Uh, trade Development Agency, uh, and as well as actions from Congress. They, they passed the uh, uh, European Energy Security Diversification Act, which provided, you know, funding to provide, you know, U.S. options to uh, really Russian design technologies, whether it be gas, coal, or, or nuclear, uh, in certain parts of Central and Eastern Europe. So I think that the U.S. government is, is really coming around to, you know, the need to have you know, the safe and safeguarded U.S. technology out there and available to uh, the developing world. Um, because frankly, most of the market is outside of the U.S. I mean, we're blessed. We use about 10,000 kilowatt hours a year of electricity. The rest of the world is somewhere down around one or 2,000 kilowatt hours per year. And there are many parts where there's zero being used. In order to get clean energy out to those parts of the world, we need solutions uh, such as New Scales and others coming you know, along with us, whether it be an Oak Low or a Westinghouse or a GE. We need U.S. technology solutions out there. Countries want them. We need to provide the financing for it. And I think the U.S. is really starting to turn to making that a, a viable uh, option to it. So again, we have affordable, safe and safeguarded U.S. technology options available to those countries. Uh, yeah, Ashley, yeah, please go ahead. Um, I would just comment and, and add that um, I think as, as we pursue U.S. global leadership in nuclear energy, it is critical that we're developing the best technology in the world. And in fact, I think we are. Um, and we're, we're well positioned to be successful if we achieve the goals that Dr. Baranol has set. Um, and so having the best technology is important, but U.S. companies um, you mentioned a few of the competitors, they're really in competition with state-owned enterprises in many markets. Um, and that means that you know, for, those, for those countries that have state-owned nuclear um, industries, they can um, have a government-to-government -government negotiation and governments can access a lot more levers than, than companies and inducements of things. Um, they can also advertise more effectively in a lot of ways. There is only one option out of that given country and, and they can have, um, you know, advertising in government, um, government conversations. Um, so the US is not going to pursue and we're not pursuing a state owned enterprise approach, but DOE and other parts of the US government are working very hard right now to prioritize ways that will really improve the exposure of US companies in global markets and, and to try to make those markets more accessible to US companies and, and to make us more competitive. And elements of that include the, the DFC, um, the De Development Finance Corporation um, uh, activities that, that 
Mr. Colbert mentioned, um, but there are others. So I'm, I'm optimistic about the steps that DOE and others are taking right now to, to try to make the US more competitive overseas. Yeah, and Jane, on the, the question you asked me about additional policy uh, measures that I think would be useful, um, I think there's I think there's a, a bunch. As, as I mentioned, we've made great progress in policy space over the last five years. But I think there's a few few more places we need to to move. Some of them are actually in the Nuclear Energy Leadership Act, right, which is working its way through Congress right now. But as examples, uh, power purchase agreements, right? If I look at how we drove the costs down of renewables. We basically said we are going to purchase renewables or we're going to mandate certain fractions on the grid. It incentivized commercial competition and it really drove the prices down, right? So I think things like those power purchase agreements are a big deal. Uh, I think we need to maintain the national test bed. I talked about this before. You want those laboratory assets being one step ahead of the companies. Um, and so in the NELA Act, we've got the the first um, a versatile test reactor, right? Which would put the US in a position of having test capability that'll really help those, those uh, com companies. Uh, to one of the points Ashley made, I think better interface with um, newcomer, newcomer countries. If I go back and look at how Korea or how Japan developed their programs in nuclear, it was in very close cooperation with the US, right? We helped train their staff in, in our ways of doing safety and our ways of doing operation. And I think being out in front uh, with some of the countries that are not nuclear, but want to be, um, will, will help to what Ashley talked about in making us the, the vendor of choice also, because we're, we're training into our standards. Um, I think you start to see a little work in the GAIN program on what we call safeguards by design. Think about the safeguard ability ahead of time you know, in the design phase. Um, and I think you know, we have more work to do there. Um, the uh, Partnership for Global Security has been pushing hard on that for the last few years to make sure we're not thinking about that after the fact and having that be a barrier for, for entry into some markets. Uh, so I think that's important. Um, uh, a couple others, uh, uh, Ashley mentioned international finance. I think the Development Finance Corporation, assuming they take the step and change their policy, that, that's big, right? We need to be able to, to leverage or tap into financing mechanisms for, for uh, deploying power overseas. Um, and then I would say two other things. One, we need to continue to make sure that we're not having a discussion about nuclear alone, that we're having discussion about how nuclear fits into a broader clean energy portfolio, because I think that makes us more relevant to the discussions. Um, I think historically nuclear wanted to do its own thing, but I don't think in, in the real business world, right, that's the way it works. And the last thing I'll mention is um, I think we work really hard on technology and regulatory policy. I don't think we think nearly as much about um, community engagement, and sort of the social science aspects of deployment, um, which you go back 50, 60 years, we did not do a, a good job of in a lot of cases. Um, it's, not a, it's not actually um, a word, right? But in the same way we think about safeguards by design, I almost think we need something like social science by design. We need to be very thoughtful ahead of time. Um, and I know in talking to Ashley, when she thinks about you know, a deployment center, it's not just technology, right? She wants to figure out how to get these things deployed and part of that is how, how do you get the acceptance of communities? And so I think that's one we really need to put more effort into compared to our traditional technology approaches. Interesting, no, that's, that, these are really great um, comments and insights. The, I'm, and Todd, I'm glad that you also uh, mentioned how, um, you know, that it really needs to be in a context of clean energy transition. The, I was think, so in, in many ways, I think, you know, nuclear innovation, um, you know, from, you know, what I am observing is very much bipartisan space, you know, it's, uh, you know, it has a lot of support from, you know, across the, the, the um, you know, aisle for perhaps different reasons, but, you know, there is a pretty solid bipartisan support. Um, but then when it comes to climate, I think there's still a bit of a, you know, um, difference, um, you know, uh, depending on a, a, a political affiliation. 
But you know, as we are, you know, the, there's, um, you know, I'd say, you know, society-wise, you know, when you poll people, the general public, I think there are more and more people. Uh, perhaps it's more generational thing as well, but concern about, you know, the effects of climate change. How do you think that gap, the partisan or nonpartisan gap? may be changing in some you know um, years ahead and how that may um, you know affect the way that we approach um, the role of government in nuclear innovation in other words i mean the past uh, government played a very prominent role in you know uh, getting all these technologies out in the market i think in in you know but I think that some of the debates around what you know could be done uh, in the next four years, eight years, it also sort of hints at perhaps the larger role for the government. Perhaps you know as um, you know the economies around the world, including ours, have been uh, uh, quite you know significantly impacted by uh, the pandemic, uh, how it destroyed a lot of uh, uh, sort of growth engines and etc. But then there's sort of an uh, and renewed look at you know what it means to have resilient system, and it's not it's not a partisan issue, but like being within that, I think that the availability of electricity it has renewed appreciation, right? As we are commuting from home and doing all these webinars and etc. So I think going for I'm just sort of trying to see how our minds like are that or the way we look at the role of the government in innovation, particularly nuclear innovation, may or may not be changing. Um, yeah, and then that's, I guess, the immediate question. I have a couple more questions from the audience as well, but Todd, would you would you like to take that uh, perhaps? Sure, I'll, I'll at least give you my take and then let Chris and, and Ashley weigh in. So, I mean, I think that um, uh, relative to the bipartisan nature, I think there's a generational thing going on, right? So I teach at a university now and there's lots of students and they care very much about climate um, and they're very open to um, whatever sol solution gets you to cleaner energy production, right? They care, they want it to be clean, they want it to be equitable, right? I think a big issue is going to be as we deploy a lot of new energy technology, are we doing it in a way that is uh, more fair or less harmful to certain communities than, than we've done it in the past? Um, and I think um, they want, so it's clean, affordable, equitable energy. Okay? And I don't think they're preconceived to the same debates that someone in my age generation might have been. So I think you'll see less nuclear versus um, other technologies as long as you're moving in that direction. Um, I think relative to government role, uh, I think there are certain things that the government does well, right? They sponsor R&D, they help you get first deployer technologies an opportunity to prove themselves. So we talked about this relative to deployment sites. We talked about this relative to power purchase agreements. And if you look at the history of how we brought costs down for renewables, it was a very um, linked combination of R&D and sort of commercial incentives. And so I think there is a role. I personally like to keep an element of commercial competition in there. Right? I, I don't think the traditional way, for a long time, we would sort of rally behind one national nuclear project, right? It was gonna be NGMP, it was gonna be GNEP. Um, I would rather have Chris and his colleagues out there competing and, and coming up with business cases and proving themselves um, and using the government as more of a, a support structure when needed. And I, I think that helps, helps move you there. Um, but I do think it's important that we are in a discussion where we're part of the clean energy deployment future. Uh, just quickly, you know, the, one of the, you know, actually you sort of mentioned, you know, how the, uh, many of our competitors are state owned. And I think one of the features of state owned tend to be that they, uh, even for the R&D side, they have a very stable um, budget, you know, budgetary outlook um, that, you know, spans for at least 10 years, if not like 20 years or so. That's something that I think for innovation, at least, you know, very much early, you know, uh, phase of innovation, very much appreciate it. Um, so in, in that sense, I do, obviously I'm not, you know, advocating for a state-owned approach here, but I, you know, I do wonder, you know, how much more could be done on that front, at least some, you know, a little more stability uh, for the early side, um, you know, if you have any sort of a thought or maybe, you know, different way to look at the, the nature of this competition, um, you know, I, I'd love to hear your, your insight. Yeah, well, I, I, um, yeah, go ahead, Ashley, I've been talking too much anyway. No, you haven't. But um, but I'll, I'll say something briefly, and then I think you'll have some more direct policy um, thoughts. But um, I think you, you hit on something important, that stability and sustained effort is really 
important to successful innovation. We can't stop and start projects. You lose teams and you lose momentum and, um, and you, you just can't be successful and companies can't work with stop and start. Um, some of these companies are, are startups and this is their, their one product and that's appropriate for a startup, but they need to see it through to completion and they rely upon moving forward quickly. So if they're working with the government um, and the government is up and down on support, that's very challenging. Um, so it is, it is crucial to have that kind of sustained commitment. And we've seen literature um, that's looked at the nuclear research and development programs and looked at success and lack of success. So Mike Ford um, did a paper on this out of Carnegie Mellon with Granger Morgan and some others. And they looked at all the programs and they really found that the Tristo fuel program, um, advanced, advanced fuel program has been highly successful, but that's in part because it has had a decade or more of sustained support. And so they've been able to move forward. So I think that's a key, um, a key need, but of course it's a challenge given how our, our budgets work and just the reality of how things work. So there have been proposals of um, green development banks and things like that. I don't know um, what the status is of those, but I, I turn it over to Todd and see if Todd, you have any specific um, policies there. Yeah, I, I don't necessarily have anything to say on that last one, but I do want to. I do want to support something you said on stability, which is another concern: is if you're not stable, right? And we've seen this in the past, which is if if you are feeling under budgeted and not stable, we will launch all of our resources in one direction, right, for a short period of time, and what that means is you've got no group of people who are trying to develop technologies that may leapfrog you one generation ahead of time, right? And so having some set of policies where we're gonna say, we, we want it to be stable or growing, right? And it takes us from early innovation up to deployment and we stick with that, right? And we've got a set of ground rules that say, when we get to deployment, right? We want to work with companies and here's how we're going to do it, right? Um, if, if uh, you know, and I'm just making this up, I, um, this is not policy, but I've always thought, when I get to deployment, I ought to look at how much private investment does a company have. If they have more, they're probably more real. Maybe that is a reason to stick with them, right? But I think it's having a set of rules like that or, or accepted practices that will help us, right, continue to move things forward. Because I do think Ashley pointed out something very important. You look at the history of nuclear, we'll lurch ourselves at something for a couple of years, we'll go to dead stop, 10 years later, we'll lurch ourselves at the same thing. We'll be trying to find the reports in Bob's garage, right? Because no one knows what we did with them 10 years ago. And it's nuts, right? It's just absolutely nuts. Um, Chris, do you have anything to add or shall I just, I'll just move on uh, to the next question? Why don't you go ahead and move on to the next question? Sounds good. Um, so. Um, some of the uh, questions from the audience actually concern more of a spent fuel side. And I wanted to, you know, this, uh, you know, obviously this session is about innovation, but in the spent fuel um, management sector too, what are some of the implications that may arise from the innovation work that's underway? That's one. The other question related to this is what are some of the uh, um, advancements we may be able to expect in managing uh, spent fuel uh, issue? Uh, that you see on the horizon. Um, I'll, I'll make one remark on that and then see what, what Todd and Chris have to add. Um, I think we, we do see innovations in, um, particularly in disposition and, and storage. Um, there's, there's at least one, probably a couple of startup companies out there pursuing advanced technologies. So deep borehole technology, taking advantage of research that actually goes back many decades, but then also taking advantage of, of newer horizontal drilling technology um, that can enable uh, more, well, an interesting approach to storage um, and disposal. So I think that there is innovation happening there. There's also the, uh, the fact that many of these advanced technologies do enable um, recycling or reprocessing of nuclear fuel, of used nuclear fuel. Um, and enable us to move towards a closed fuel cycle if that's the decision that, that, that we pursue. Um, so I think there are a lot of opportunities as we open up the technology space to um, look at new approaches to 
fuel handling and storage. Yeah, Jaina, the two things I would add to Ashley's comments are, I think in addition to recycling, some of the companies actually um, are doing things technologically that get better utilization of the fuel, right? So you just need less fuel overall because you're getting more of the energy content out of that. Um, and I think back to my comment on, on social science, I, you know, I also look around the world and you look at places like Finland that have been able to cite a repository. Um, they didn't do it by command and control. It was much more of a consent-based approach. Um, and I think that's just absolutely necessary um, to make success, right? You, you want the hosts to feel value in them being the hosts. And so I think that um, in addition to a lot of technolog technological things, I think that will keep coming up. I just want to maybe provide some perspective. Um, you know, for our first project with the Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, we're basically aggregating you know, 34 different municipalities to be in this project. And as a result of that, we had to guide uh, presentations to those communities about what the carbon free power project was, technology, and everything else. And, you know, what was common across all those meetings is that the first question that was asked was about safety. The second question was about the spent fuel and the third question was about the economics. Safety question handled pretty quickly. The spent fuel question, once we sort of said, look, we can put 60 years of the spent fuel on this one acre pad and dry cast storage on the corner of the nuclear power plant site. They were like, oh, that, that's what you're talking about. They had a totally different perception of what spent fuel was. It might've been the Homer Simpson spent fuel. It might've been the Hanford Waste Repository, you know, weapons um, waste. But whatever it was, there was definitely a, uh, a change in perception of it. And then the third thing on the, on the economics, we said, you know, look, basically, you can recycle the fuel, but it's just cheaper to buy new fuel right now. At some point, we figured out how to recycle aluminum and became efficient to take and recycle aluminum. At some point, it seems to me that when you have 96% of the energy left in the fuel, somebody's going to figure out how to get that energy back out in a way that is A, cost effective, and B, doesn't lead to a proliferation concern. It hasn't happened yet, but it's, it's hard to imagine that it won't because the amount of value that's in there. But the, the truth is we just have really cheap new fuel. And as long as that continues to be the case, that economic driver is gonna be there. And, and I think that the folks that are involved in the, in the UAMP's Carbon Free Power Project uh, understood that. I mean, they run their municipal waste systems. They look at it and say, Hey, it used to be we could have everything recycled and we send it over to China. China stopped taking it. Guess what? We had to open up some landfills and looked at other things to do with the, with the waste. So um, I think there's a, a growing appreciation of it. But, you know, people have to be open to that consideration because, like I said, there's a visceral reaction to the term just spent fuel or nuclear waste. But once people have an appreciation of what it is, I, you can have a conversation about it, which... You know, typically you don't get into a conversation, you get into an argument about it first. So that, that to me has been my observation of, of dealing through those uh, community interactions. And, you know, I think really up for the folks up at INL, um, it's even, even, you know, more educated populace up there where the plant is going to be, given they have uh, projects to remove away what used to be you know, defense waste or other waste out of there, and that is manageable and doable. And as you have success doing it, people are like, okay, we understand it is not a technical problem. You know, it's really, and it's not really a cost problem. It's, it's a political problem. And if you can get beyond that, I think people are pretty, pretty open to the conversation. No, that was very, uh, you know, uh, thanks for the thoughtful observation, Chris. Um, I mean, unless someone has a sort of a burning last comment, I, I want to just uh, you know, sort of uh, mention how, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that we're sort of, we ended with that, um, that set of sort of questions at the end, because I think, you know, this advanced reactor innovation effort could really give the United States uh, nuclear ecosystem a chance to really uh, enforce and perhaps to some extent revitalize our, our leadership when it comes to safety, um, security, and proliferation efforts. And, and I'm so glad that there's a lot happening in many ways. I think diversity here is really a beauty. A lot of different developers uh, looking at different technologies. It's seen you know, as Todd and, and also um, obviously Ashley have mentioned and, and also by, you know, um, Chris being here, we can tell that it's not a top-down process. It's very much collaborative. It's really a true partnership. In, in many ways, we still have so much to offer 
on the uh, uh, in the nuclear um, uh, reactor technology um, uh, field, and I'm just uh, quite encouraged uh, uh, that you know, there's so much happening. And also, I think we're very much, you know, um, efforts have been much more um, better coordinated. It's not to say centralized; it's not centralized. It's uh, very much well coordinated. Um, and on that note, just uh, quickly, I mean, I'd like to thank uh, the sponsors, uh, ClearPath, as well as in Energy Innovation Fund uh, with the National Philanthropic Trust for the chance to have this series. Um, and again, this was the fourth in the, the six part series, and we're looking forward to having the fifth one this fall um, and uh, could be virtual I, I, that I can speak to, but we are very much looking forward to welcoming back the uh, virtual audience and also uh, then be presenting uh, the audience with an excellent uh, panel, uh, that the way that we manage this time. We're so happy. Thanks again, Chris, Todd, and Ashley, as well as uh, Rita, Assistant Secretary Baranwell, for the, the time that you spent with us, all the insights. And uh, you know, I hope this will be a continued conversation, discussion with all of you. Um, and thank you again, everyone uh, the, in the audience uh, for all the great questions as well. And uh, please, stay, uh, please stay tuned for all our future events as well. Thanks.